Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. This morning we are happy to have Dr. Morvan Edwards with us. Dr. Edwards is Professor of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine in uh, the section of Infectious Disease and an attending physician at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. She's the recipient of a cooperative agreement through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to improve knowledge and practices among healthcare providers about congenital Chagas disease. This morning, Dr. Edwards will be speaking to us about congenital Chagas disease. Please welcome Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much for having me and for that kind introduction. I, I would also like to give a special thanks to Dr. Federico Laham, who is one of our former um, postdoctoral fellows. So I, I didn't know anybody else here in Orlando, and I called him up and asked him if he could help me to be invited here. So <laughs> thank you so much for, for that and for um, showing me some of your really beautiful city. Uh, last night, and I also want to thank Nancy Ramos because she there's a little bit of paperwork that's involved in coming to give a grand rounds, and she helped me to wade through that. So um, I have no disclosures, and this the good news about this being a cooperative agreement is that I have input from the CDC parasitic people. So I was I I learned about this as I went. And uh, what I hope that we can do this morning is to speak a little bit about, about who you might consider Chagas disease risk in, um, how you might look for people uh, by clinical findings, and then what you might do to establish a diagnosis. So let me ask you all a couple of questions. The first is, um, how many of you in the room have ever, uh, have ever ordered a diagnostic test to see if someone has Chagas disease? It would be the <laughs> as expected, the infectious disease attendings, and basically nobody else. And I hope by the end of the morning that that, that will have changed. Um, the, the second question is, who are you all? How many of you all are residents here in your pediatric training and, and, and sitting by row assignment, I see? <laughs> and then how many are faculty members in the department? And you, you all get the leftover seats, I guess. It's a fascinating phenomenon. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, and then let me ask also, um, how many, of, does everybody, did everybody get one of those yellow pretest sheets? Is there anybody that does not have one? Would you all mind filling those out if you haven't already? because this helps to sustain my funding for this educational endeavor. So we'll move forward as you're having just a minute more to get those filled out. And I'll, I'll say to you that, that uh, there's a, a, um, a doctor in Los Angeles, her name is Sheba Maimondi, and she has a, an, a cardiology clinic for Latino patients in whom 20% of those with heart disease have Chagas disease. And so as we begin, the reason that we as pediatricians want to start back at birth, identifying the at-risk patients, is that so 20 or 30 or 40 years later, our patients won't be in a clinic like this where they are dying of cardiomyopathy with arrhythmias, heart failure, and death from Chagas disease. And the way that she words it is Chagas disease is joining that list of infections like dengue and chikungunya, and we might add now Zika, that are a concern in the United States. So my big thrust for us is to have Chagas disease enter our medical vocabulary and, and to trigger a differential thought at the right time. And the bottom line here is this is not an exotic disease anymore and we should not consider it as such. And this is coming from me, who about three or four years ago, not only I'd never seen a patient with chikungunya, I had no idea how to pronounce it. So we're, we're, this is new for all of us. 
So if you all have filled out the pretest now, um, would you mind passing them? I don't know um, if Nancy is still outside, but perhaps you could pass them to the aisles so that they kind of come out here in the middle and then we can pick those up along the way. Thank you so much, you all, for filling them out. And just parenthetically, there will be a post-test that looks exactly like the pre-test. So it's perfectly normal if you have circled, I don't know, I don't know, and I don't know. And hopefully that will change. So Chagas disease is a parasitic disease. It's caused by Trypanosoma cruzi. And the people that have it um, have lived in Mexico, Central, or South America. It's only found in the Americas, and it's estimated that as many as 10 million people in the Americas have Chagas disease, many of whom don't know it. And an estimated 10,000 people are dying from that heart disease every year. So it's, it's not a nothing disease here. Up there in the inset is Dr. Carlos Chagas himself, who um, discovered the parasite just a little over a, um, 100 years ago. So here is, here's the triatamine bug, the kissing bug. Do you all have kissing bugs here in Orlando? Has anybody ever seen them? Oh, not. oh but you do. You, you may not see them every day, but they certainly can live here. As Dr. Laham said, we hope not. I, I don't think they're probably here in the middle of the city. Um, the, these, these guys are the vector. They're not a very efficient vector. So these are blood, blood suckers. You can see his cone nose there as he's having a blood meal. And just imagine this little bug coming over to you, resting on your arm and taking a blood meal. Um, and that's not how he transmits um, the parasite. What he does is he takes his blood meal, pats his little bug stomach, and then poops and the parasite is in the fecal material. So the way that he transmits is he takes a blood meal, defecates, and then you rub the place where you had the bite, and you rub the parasite from the fecal material into the bite. So it's not the most efficient way to transmit infection. And so right now, I would, I would say to you, this is not a situation where if you go home tonight and see a kissing bug, in your backyard that you should flee to the doctor and say, I'm going to get Chagas disease. It's repeated prolonged exposure that probably results in infection. But here's what happens after you have, um, after you have had the, the um, triatamine in, into you through the fecal material, the part that is injected into your bloodstream here is the trypomastigote. And this is what it looks like in a blood smear. So here's, here's blood after the parasite has been transmitted. If you do a geme sustain, this is the trypomastigote of the parasite. And you can see he's got a flagella, and he moves really quickly. I just got to see a clip, film clip of him in the bloodstream, and he's whipping that flagella around, just swimming around, trying to find a cell to get into. And so here he comes. After that, he is in you, and he finds a cell that he wants to go into, and he transforms into the amastigote stage of the parasite. And that looks like this. Each one of these little dark things is one of the amastigotes, and that's the form that can multiply um, by binary fission. And here are the, each one of the little, little amastigote forms using up the food materials in the cell and multiplying. Yik! <laughs> the um, the amastigote form has a tropism for heart muscle. So this is amastigotes, T-shot, trypanosome cruzi, amastigotes in skeletal heart muscle. So these parasites have a tropism for heart muscle and for the smooth muscle of the intestines from the esophagus all the way down to the colon. So over time, if you've got Chagas disease and you have the parasite multiplying in heart muscle, you can see how over time the heart muscle is going to weaken and um, stretch. And so you're going to get an infectious 
cardiomyopathy that is associated with weakening of the heart muscle. And this, that cycle occurs over 10 or even 20 years. So we want to stop that early in the course of infection. And what happens after that is and they run out of nutrients in the, in the cell that they're in. They um, pop back into the circulation and transform back into the trypomastigotes where if a kissing bug comes along at that time, you can transmit from, from um, one of the reservoir species to another, whether it's from you to a small mammal or vice versa. That's what happens. And then on the left side of the slide, the cycle in the kissing bug is that he ingests the parasite in a blood meal, but it matures in his hind gut and out it comes ready to infect somebody else. So that's the only hard part of the whole talk. Now you've got the cycle of the parasite down. And what I'd like to show here is um, the states that have the vector, the kissing bug, um, and that would include Florida, and the mammalian species that are the vector, the reservoir species, and, and that would be Florida also. So you all have not only mammals that can sustain um, the vector, but you've got um, the vector itself here in Florida. Well, what are some of the species that can have shy dust disease? Um, anybody exposed to infected vectors in reservoirs is at risk. Are any of you starting to scratch yet? No. Okay, good, okay. But, but here, here's looking at the bottom of the slides. Do you all have possums here in, in Orlando? I have one that lives under my house, so it's not just, not just Florida. And then raccoons are reservoir species. Um, armadillos, we've got a lot of those in Texas. Do they live in Florida? Yeah. Um, squirrels, I've got, got a squirrel that just thinks his bird, my bird feeder is his bird feeder. So, and, and, and dogs. If you all, vets know a lot about Chagas disease because dogs can get the cardiomyopathy also. So lots of species can, can host, um, uh, can be reservoir s sources for the parasite. The, um, the areas that are endemic, I was just chatting uh, before the talk, include Brazil and Argentina and a number of other South American countries as well as Central America and then parts of Mexico, particularly in the South. So here's where I ask you all, what, what proportion of the patients that you serve here um, at Arnold Palmer Hospital, and here I guess at Winnie Palmer Hospital, what proportion of patients would either have come directly from one of these countries that are endemic um, or had a parent that came from one of these countries. Can anybody shout out a percentage? 60. 60, so more than half. <laughs> I was going to go five. You were both. You were going to go? Probably five percent. What, what percent? Five, ten. Five to ten percent? <laughs> we're, we're thinking of Puerto Ricans. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's it's not endemic in Puerto Rico, and that's an important distinction. So all the red areas. E either directly, these you know, direct um, directly coming here themselves, or a first generation. We have a lot of Brazilians here in town. Uh huh. Uh, it's a very large uh, Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. At least one Argentinian. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, we've kind of got a range here, but if it's as low as 10, 5 to 10 percent or as high as 60, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter either way. Let me put my main message forward now. I have come to believe after, after several years of intensely being interested in getting um, uh, targeted screening performed that anybody who has, has actually lived in an endemic region and children of moms who have lived in endemic regions 
should be screened once in their life to find out if they have Chagas disease. I'm not sure how to best um, implement that, but those are the patients in whom you should consider the diagnosis, and we'll move forward now with that. Let's look at the population at risk. We've kind of just said it. There's thought to be at least 300,000 people in the U.S. who have Chagas disease. They have virtually all come from these endemic regions. There's hot spots in southern Mexico. Big ones are El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, partly because you all are a little bit unique in having a large Brazilian population. Um, Bolivia is another hot spot if you happen to have uh, people from uh, Bolivia. But, and we've talked about how the southern states that can support both the parasite, um, the kissing bug, and the mammalian reservoirs um, can, in theory, allow for transmission in the U.S., but to date, there's been less than 50 cases that have been acquired here in the U.S., so that's not a big problem. The problem is what we just talked about is the immigration patterns over the past 10 and 20 years who have brought many people to us, and we're happy to have every one of them in the United States. We just want to be able to serve them in a way that we find out if they're at risk for long-term heart disease. And the reason that all this came to light was about a decade ago, um, the, the blood banks decided, the, the American Association of Blood Banks decided to add Chagas disease to their routine screening procedure. How many of you all have ever uh, volunteered to give blood or a blood product? Excellent. So we, we, are, we are solid citizens. And if you have given blood in the past approximately decade, you probably have been screened for Chagas disease, and you probably could find it out. And if you haven't heard anything, you don't. So that's good. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm almost sure because okay. no screening test is 100%, but I'm pretty sure. So, so, so after um, 2007, when they started to screen, a second test was added. And then they have guidelines, and the guidelines specify that you should be screened one time, and if you're negative, they won't screen you every time. Um, they started looking back because they found out that you could spread it not only through blood but through organ donation. And as of now, basically the whole U.S. blood supply is screened for Chagas. So, so, so now you can rest comfortably and, and know if you've given, you probably don't have it. And here's, here's where people are that the blood banks have identified as having Chagas disease uh, since they began testing. So we have about 2,300 confirmed positive people. You all know that you represent a select part of the population who are um, our blood donors. So this is not necessarily totally representative of the population. But what it says is that people that live in my state, Texas, your state, Florida, and places like California and other places like Atlanta has a whole lot of people from Bolivia living in it, and New York, who has a lot of people from everywhere living in it, um, are the places where people are being identified. And so those would be the places where we might look the hardest. And here is the great state of Florida. You can see that there's a lot of people identified down here in the Miami area. In fact, Miami is obliterated by red dots. But Orlando, you can still read through. You all have a good number of red dots right here in Orlando. So people are being identified with Chagas disease here in Orlando. How can, you, how can you transmit the infection? The main way is going to be vector-borne. These people who have it came to us because they contracted it in their um, country of origin. We've talked about blood-borne. Shouldn't be an issue now that we screen. Food and water-borne is restricted to endemic regions, for example, with outdoor <coughs> fruit stands that can be contaminated um, with fecal material from infected uh, kissing bugs. Lab accidents is hopefully a minor concern, but then congenital infection we'll talk about a little bit. So moms who have infection can transmit infection to their babies. Which moms is it? But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if they got infection three months ago, three years ago, or 30 years ago. 
and most of these moms who are at risk to transmit infection, number one, never knew they had infection, and number two, now have chronic infection, and it's not on their radar at all that they have Chagas disease, but they will be able to transmit infection to their babies. And here's what it looks like acutely. Um, the, the, um, the person here with the swollen eyeball has um, what's called Romagna sign. It's a painless, firm swelling around the eye from rubbing fecal material into the conjunctiva. And this little boy down here has a bite on his lower lip with some swelling, and that also is a shagoma, the site of the initial bite that, where he's rubbed it in through his lip. So the swelling uh, is firm and lasts several weeks. So let's talk about um, the manifestations in <coughs> pregnant women and infants. And here's what it looks like. So if you were bitten by um, a kissing bug and rubbed the material into you, four to eight weeks later you would have acute Chagas disease. The illness is a flu-like illness, low-grade fever, not distinctive, so probably you would not go to the doctor knowing that you were going to be diagnosed with Chagas disease. Most people don't seek medical attention when they have the acute infection. And then after you have acquired infection, it goes into the chronic phase where infection is lifelong if untreated. That's a bummer, you guys. So here's all these people that got the infection and they're going to have it lifelong. And some of them are going to stay in the what's called the indeterminate form for the whole rest of their life and never know they had it. But 20 to 40 percent are going to progress over to having that heart disease that can often be fatal or with the intestinal smooth muscle to having um, ballooning of the esophagus, mega esophagus ballooning of the colon, mega colon. Now this is really bad. I mean, I've now seen pictures. It can really balloon. And this doesn't usually kill you, but it would be terribly unpleasant. It gives horrible, unremitting constipation. So we would really like to find the disease as soon as possible. Um, what you're, who you're going to suspect it in is going to be women, for the most part, in the chronic phase, who themselves are at risk to progressing, and who, if they give their infection to their babies, have babies that then go through the same cycle. Everybody with me? Are you ready to start testing? Let's see. Mother-to-child transmission. This is um, a transplacental infection. It's thought to occur in the second or third trimester of pregnancy. It is not associated with congenital malformations. So that, for example, leaves out Zika in the differential. Um, these babies won't have um, malformations. And as we've said, their moms are going to be usually asymptomatic. I've put it here in giant letters and in green. The rate of transmission from a chronically infected mom to her babies is 1 to 10 percent. So just kind of tuck away that figure. There's things that make it higher. It's higher if you're in an endemic region because possibly you're still getting exposed to the parasite. And it can be as high as 14 percent among, as it was among a group of Bolivian uh, refugees living in Spain for the most part. But 1 to 10 percent is the transmission rate. Things that include, in, enhance it would be a high maternal parasitic load. There's different genotypes of the parasite, and that has not been studied as a risk factor. Do you see a fair amount of HIV infection still here in Florida? Yeah, HIV co-infection, just like for what other infections does it enhance risk for? CMB? CMB? Syphilis. Syphilis, absolutely. Hepatitis C, hepatitis B, Chagas disease. So think of it as an infection that is, uh, has an enhanced risk with HIV. It can cluster in families, which may just be um, a feature of similar exposure, but that also um, needs more study. 
and possibly because of placental insufficiency, <coughs> higher maternal age associated with, is associated with transmission. At the, at the specific mom and specific baby, those things don't matter that much, but they should just raise our radar a little bit. So here's the nuts and bolts. It's estimated that there's 40,000 women in the U.S. in the childbearing years who have Chagas disease, and basically all of them don't know it. And so that results in an estimated 63 to 315 babies born every year in the U.S. So right now, when you think about that pot, every year we're adding another several hundred babies. And so there's thousands of little children running around with Chagas disease that's undiagnosed. If you wanted to round that off because our minds think better in rounding off, and if you were taking a post-test, you might say there were 50 to 500 babies born every year in the U.S. with Chagas disease. So how many of them do you think we have made the diagnosis in? So here's this pot of women giving birth to infected babies. Anybody want to hazard a guess on how many we've identified in the U.S.? 10%. 10%. That's an excellent guess. It's on the, you know, that would mean you were identifying, um, say, 5 to 50 a year. That's a very good because you're on, on the low end. Anybody else? Okay. You all are quiet this morning. Okay, it's two. So we are totally not getting this yet on our radar, and I hope that here in Orlando we can change that around. The smart little babies, I have always, I, I don't know if I ever said that um, on rounds with you, but I, if, if you are a baby who has congenital herpes infection, the smart, or perinatal herpes, I'm sorry, um, not, not congenital, but perinatal, um, the smart babies with neonatal herpes are the ones who have infection limited to the skin, eye, and mouth. And they have blisters on their skin and the rest of them as well. And if I see a baby like that, I always say, this is a smart baby. He's wearing his disease on his skin where we can see it and make the diagnosis before it causes life-threatening infection. So here, there are 10 to 40 percent of babies who have congenital Chagas disease who are smart enough to wear their disease with symptoms at birth. And so clues to identifying them for us as pediatric caregivers, seeing babies in the nursery, is if you see a baby who's premature, who has perhaps hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice, or anemia and thrombocytopenia, what infections are you going to think about? CMV. CMV, absolutely. Somebody over here? Pardon, rubella. Somebody in the back who is a resident? <laughs> what about syphilis? So, so you go through the usual suspects and you look for CMV and you look for, C, for syphilis and you screen for rubella and toxoplasmosis. And so right now we've got a differential that we don't usually like the acronym, but it's TORCH, right? So if you're thinking torch, this baby's got a torch infection. And I have done this probably a thousand times. I order those tests, and it's not one of the usual suspects. Then the, what should your next question be? Where's the, mother from? Where's the mother from? Perfect. If the mother is from an endemic region, this baby should have screening for Chagas disease. So I've now started to do this. I'm doing this in the nursery. If I see a baby who has findings suggestive of congenital infection and the mom is from an endemic region, we should be screening that baby, and I hope you all will too. None of the findings is specific for Chagas disease. The first report of a baby with congenital disease, so one of the two that we've identified um, was in 2010, and his mom had come from Bolivia, so he, had, he was born prematurely, had low birth weight, okay APGARS, but what he had was ascites, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion. And what happened with him was that after about two weeks, his mother sort of said, 
you know, somebody told me that I had Chagas disease. So it wasn't that they thought, oh, let's screen the baby. The mom told them that she had it, and she was from Bolivia. <laughs> I have had this from the horse's mouth. So the blood smear then shows the trypomastigotes that we've seen, and the diagnosis is made by PCR in the baby. And he was treated um, with benzonidazole, which is the drug of choice, for 60 days and was cured. Now, if you see a baby with um, high drops, like ascites and pleural effusion and pericardial effusion, what infectious disease are you thinking of in a newborn? Pardon? CM somebody say CMP? Yes. Anybody else? Parvovirus. So yeah, you're thinking you're thinking parvoviral infection with the with the um, high drops. And so same story, second verse, if you see a baby who should have an infectious disease with high drops, but it's not parvovirus and it's not an incompatibility, then think Chagas. So both babies that we have identified have had high drops fatalis, and, and that's another place that we should consider and screen with the right uh, maternal history. So the challenges, there's a number of challenges, but I think we can overcome them if we think about it. None of the symptoms is pathognomonic, so they're nonspecific. But a biggest problem is that I don't think we, um, I think we need to enter this into our medical vocabulary. So will you all commit to ordering testing? How, how many of you, do you rotate through the nursery as residents? Okay, so you will, you, enough? <laughs> for a number of months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there will be places for you to think about this. Because, because we can start with the babies until we get to um, screening high-risk women, which would be optimal to identify infection. The prevalence of infection in the U.S. is not known, and um, that's kind of where I stepped into Chagas. I had had a teenager referred to me because she screened positive when she donated blood and that resulted in me saying, I have no idea what to do here. So you all know also that when you have no idea what to do, um, call the CDC if it's an infection. And they are very helpful. And I was helped in knowing how to treat my patients. But then I had opportunity to collaborate in doing a seroprevalence study in the county hospital that we have in Houston. It's called Ben Tobb. And at that time, 2011 to 12, more than 75% of the moms delivering there cited Mexico, Central, or South America as their country of origin. And I should say that more women in our population were from Mexico than other countries. And the screening test we performed, which was an ELISA, was positive on in 28 of, of, of 4,000 women screened consecutively. So if you were doing screening, you would want it to overread positives when you screened. And then when we did a confirmatory test through CDC, we identified Chagas disease in 10 women out of these 4,000. So then when I, when I set this up with our IRB, I got permission if I found positive women to, because we were using residual blood, to allow me to reconnect the blood with the person and try to locate the person because ethically I didn't think I could do this if I couldn't find the women and, and their babies. So these women um, ended up being older than those who were negative and ended up in our population being from Mexico, El Salvador, and Honduras with more being from El Salvador than other locales. And I was able to, to locate and bring into my clinic eight of the ten moms and their babies. And these moms were not familiar with Chagas disease. They didn't know the name when I asked them. And they didn't have relatives with heart disease. And they did not themselves believe that they had heart disease. But the clue, and here if you want to hone down on who to screen, is all had lived in rural areas of Mexico or Central America. And we've said that the Infection is acquired by repeated exposure to the parasite through the kissing bugs. 
and they they their desired living places are the chinks in um, homes made of mud or adobe or in the thatching of thatched roofs because then they can sleep during the day and come out at night from the chinks and the thatching and take blood meals from the sleeping people within in the home and that's the that's the repeated story of people that have Chavez disease and come to us and that's the story that I got from these moms so thankfully out of the eight infants that I had although one was premature the others were healthy term babies and we followed their serologic tests out and their antibodies had been maternally acquired and went away by seven months. So there's some other infections where we would follow the baby to find out that the infection had gone away. Can you all think of any of them? HIV. Pardon? HIV. HIV, excellent. And, that, and sometimes syphilis. Sometimes we don't know if the baby really had it and we're gonna follow serology out. So, so that, that works for Chagas. If it's passively acquired maternal antibodies, it should decay by about seven months of age. Actually, nine months is what the cutoff says. So if we could identify women at risk, we would want to screen those from endemic regions, and particularly at risk would be those who live rurally rather than in cities, and who lived in homes where the kissing bug can live. And we've said that it's not often acquired in the U.S. So you all formulating groups of people in whom to suspect it. Well, let's, let's talk about what to do if you do suspect it. I hope that we will logarithmically increase the number of people in the room who test for it in a few minutes, okay? So, Congenital infection can be diagnosed by PCR because these babies were infected in utero and out they come with a high parasitic load. So the best way to make the diagnosis in a newborn is to send um, blood for PCR to the CDC. And if the baby is more than two or three months old, the best way to make the diagnosis is by serology, watching the antibody decay. Does that make sense to everybody? The, the reason that PCR is not good after the first few months of life is that the parasitic load in the blood is too low to get a positive PCR. You have to use serology. Does that make sense also? Because the parasite's not mainly circulating in the blood, he's in the tissues transformed into amastigotes, so you won't find him by PCR. So beyond the neonatal period, the first step you're going to do is to get a commercially available serologic test. So say today you see a child in clinic and his mom is from Bolivia, and you decide, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one to screen this child from Bolivia to see if he has Chagas disease. I'm going to tell his mom we're going to do it, and then we'll share the result with her. And if it's negative, we don't have to worry about him getting heart disease. So you would send a commercial serology test. In my lab, that goes through what's called send out. What do you all do if you have a test that's not performed every day in your hospital lab? Is that what you do? And you all know, what, what labs do you usually use for sending out? Are you labs? Yes. So, and, and most of the commercial labs will have a test. Most of them are using the same easy to do test. Um, and, and right now, none of them, I don't think, is offering the, the best test. It's called the Wiener test. So there's not a special lab I can recommend to you. If they screen positive, confirmatory testing is done through the CDC. If at that point you've got a screen positive person and you're now saying, I'm a busy resident, I do not have time, nor do I exactly know what to do next, this would be a good time to call your ID people. <laughs> say, From eight to four, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, only during business hours. So, so, so then the screening test positive specimens um, should go to the CDC 
and they will test by at least two different methods that look at different antigens on the parasite. So that confirms the diagnosis. And in some states, Chagas is reportable. Um, Florida is not yet one of them, but, um, but the, this is increasing um, as the years go by. I suspect this number will go higher. So the point there is it probably doesn't need to go through your state health lab to get to the CDC. If you, if you go again to donate blood and perish the thought, your test comes back positive. And what the letter will say to you is, you, you have thankfully given blood and we appreciate it. You have tested positive for Chagas disease. You should contact your health care provider immediately. Well, that would probably make your heart beat a little faster. And then what you would probably do is contact your personal physician, who, at least in my experience, dealing with the pediatricians in our area, as soon as somebody gets one of those kind of letters, they call infectious disease. So the, the point to make here is if you get one of these letters, sometimes it'll say, and your diagnosis was confirmed by a second test. The second test tests by a different method for the same antigen. So it's still considered a screen. You still need more testing before you really have it. And remember, the screens are designed to overread positives. So about half the people that get a letter like this won't end up really having it. So these are all screening tests. And then for treatment, um, my, uh, there are two approved drugs for treatment, but they're both kind of orphan drugs. And while they're not FDA approved, they are approved by the FDA for distribution by the CDC. Well, that's kind of fine print, and what it means is that right now the only place to get the drugs is through the CDC. That's the bad news. The good news is they deliver them very promptly within two or three days. Number one, and number two, there is no charge to your patient. Your tax dollars have already paid for them from the teeny wee bit of taxes that you have to pay as a resident or the somewhat larger amount that the rest of us have to pay, we are, we are providing these drugs to our patients. And just recently, that is in August, the, um, the preferred drug, which is benznidazole, it's just, it's a little better tolerated and you have to take it for two months instead of three. It is now approved by the FDA for use in children two to 12 years of age. Right now, there's still no manufacturer in the country that, that is um, marketing it, so the practical part doesn't change. Nifertamox is the other drug, and it causes, benzidazole causes side effects that are, that are dominantly dermatitis, and the side effects for nifertamox <coughs> is dominantly GI. So they're, these are just, they're both taken by mouth, um, for four months, two months for benzidazole, and three for nifertamox. And the important thing to say about treatment, and I think it's on this slide, is this is another task for us in pediatrics. The earlier after infection we can treat it, the more likely the cure. So it's considered that if we identify a baby who got Chagas from his or her mom, the cure rates are virtually 100% in the first year of life. The drugs are really well tolerated in the first year of life. Doesn't get any better than that. So if we can find the babies, we can easily treat and cure them. Treatment, it's easy. Look in the, the, the AAP Red Book. Treatment is always indicated for children up to the age of 18 years. And treatment is estimated to cure something like 70% of children. And basically now, the authority, those who are experts are saying anybody who is found to have Chagas disease and does not yet have advanced heart problems should receive treatment. And if you had, a, if you had I wonder if mom can give it to more than one baby. There's a, a great story about how syphilis can be given to baby after baby after baby. Well, Chagas can be transmitted in subsequent pregnancies also. So any woman who is chronically infected should be treated. 
So that's, that's kind of the story. Basically, anybody we bump into in pediatrics who has Chagas should receive treatment. So I'm going to ask now um, if we could distribute the post tests. Is, is, um, is Nancy, there she is. Nancy Ramos, thank you so much. Ms. Ramos is going to distribute the post tests. And I'm going to hope that you have those figures in mind and that if you wrote that your knowledge was limited or non-existent, just a few minutes ago that you can give yourself a better grade on that now. Um, and and um, hopefully that you will now feel like there are people where you will screen for infection. And if you can say those things, you're going to be, you're going to be kind of in an elite group. And, and I'm not, not, um, disparaging our obstetrician gynecology colleagues, um, but a, a recent survey of them showed that they, this is not yet on their radar. I would love to have opportunities to speak more to obstetrician gynecologists because they, they have click boxes in EMRs for diseases that they screen for in pregnancy, and that would be the ideal place to screen. And, and only 9% of them knew about the risk of congenital Chagas disease. It's perceived to be a disease of poverty and we need to change that, that stigma. There are some resources, and I hope you all, those were really heavy for me to carry in my briefcase. And I really don't want to take them home in the airplane today. I would love for you all to pick up one each of those handouts and just find a patient to give them to. Some of them are geared to giving to moms, protect your baby. Some of them are just information. And for those of you who are, are students or residents, this, that four page one Chagas disease in the Americas is a really nice resource um, just to read about what you've heard this morning. There's even a CME article there if you need a little extra credit hour or two. So there's uh, um, other printable resources available at the CDC website. And you can order these, these um, posters also. They're three feet high, they're laminated, and they're printed in English on one side and Spanish on the other. And you can order up to five posters for free. If you could post these in your clinics where you may see women at risk um, or their, their children, that would raise awareness on the part of the patients, which would be excellent. And there is, yes, sir. I have a question. Can it be sexually transmitted? Can it be sexually transmitted is the question. And the answer is theoretically, yes, but that is not considered to be a big mode here because it's really a bloodborne parasite. So anything bloodborne theoretically can be, but not, not a major mode. There is a CME course online um, that is an overview in three lessons um, that is at the website also, and that will give you um, a, um, a credit hour if you need a few credits before the end of the year. And my, my best thing is that I have, that we have just ready to launch a course online about congenital disease. So that should be available within a week or two online. So there's lots of work to do if you are interested in Chagas, and it includes defining the extent and distribution in women of childbearing age, risk of transmission here in the U.S., targeting high-risk women, the best ways to screen infants, getting some easy to perform a point-of-care diagnostic test would be great, and then developing some easier-to-use drugs. So I hope that you feel comfortable now with who's at risk, um, what it might look like. The, the thing about moms is they're not going to have any obvious manifestations, but 10 to 40 percent of the babies will. And first screen commercially, unless it's a baby, in which case PCR, and then um, uh, approach treatment. There are some good references. I'll point out a nice New England Journal article from 2015 by Karen Byrne, just called Chagas disease. That would be a great resource if you want to read more. 
And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge Sue Montgomery, my colleague at CDC, who is the epidemiologic team lead in the parasitic diseases branch of CDC. She's a wise um, colleague and has reviewed my slides, so I think that they're without error. And I think I've left a few minutes for questions and would be pleased to answer any that you might have. Yes. <laughs> The question is, what is the rationale for not treating those with advanced heart disease or those over 50 years of age? Uh, the problem with advanced heart disease is that it, treatment does not reverse heart disease and the cow is really out of the barn by then. The treatment can cause the side effects. And most people would say that, that it's just too late in the course for there to be any advantage to the patient. The question about not treating those over 50 is much more gray. Um, and in fact, it's probably trumped by the advice to treat anyone regardless of age, even if they're over 50, unless they have advanced heart disease. That's a great question, yes. If a mom is screened during the pregnancy and she's positive, would she receive the treatment during the pregnancy or would you wait after the baby's born? That's a, that's a wonderful, insightful question, which is, should a mom identified as having infection during pregnancy receive treatment during pregnancy or after the baby is born? I, I love how you're thinking because it makes sense to me that you would treat during pregnancy and then cure the baby, as it were, before the baby got it. Uh, but the, the recommendation is that the drugs not be used in pregnancy. They are thought to be safe in pregnancy. There are just no data to prove it. So the way that it's recommended is that you identify the mom during pregnancy and then treat after delivery. And the other part of that, which may come to mind, is that moms who are breastfeeding should defer treatment until after they have completed breastfeeding. So if the mom is positive, the baby should be screened right away and treated if positive. But the mom um, should withhold treatment until she's finished breastfeeding, which we hope she would do. Good. That's a great question. And I saw somebody else's hand up at this. Same question. My goodness, you all were having telepathic communication. I don't know. Is there any way for people that are listening online to be able to ask a question? Okay. Is there, and, and can I just ask now, how many of you m will, will order a test today, or not today, maybe sometime in the next month, do you think, do you anticipate that you will be able to use this information to screen someone? Okay. And, and the other place that you might put it in is um, adolescents in, for example, a GI clinic who have chronic constipation. Um, the question comes up, should there be, they be screened? And I would say if they have come from an endemic region, the answer is yes. Um, the other place, do you all have any transplant programs? Not here, but in there. Um, if, if, there if you see a, um, an adolescent with a cardiomyopathy who comes from an endemic region, would you screen? Yes. That's another, our, our, we have a heart transplant program and our infectious disease person who sees those patients is now routinely screening um, adolescents from endemic regions who come for heart transplant. So that's a, another spot. I think there's, those are other places besides congenital disease. Um, I, I would be a hero, I think, if I left you out five minutes early, but is there any one more last question? Yes. Uh, so related to your, your point, if you treat someone with cardiomyopathy um, due to Chagas disease, does the cardiomyopathy improve? Same question. Say, the same question. The question is, if you treat someone with cardiomyopathy, does the cardiomyopathy improve? And the answer is, unfortunately, treatment does not reverse damage already done, but it is thought, it is thought it's not proven. There are not data to prove it, but the course of patients treated with early cardiomyopathy suggests
that it prevents further progression in in people in some people. But it's another area of needed study. I had a case here at Winnie not too long ago. Um, actually, the mom was from Bolivia. She was chronically infected, and uh, I had to navigate kind of the CDC um, uh, system. And uh, we followed the baby. The testing was done at the CDC because um, it was already confirmed positive. So, but eventually the baby cleared out. It's like when we follow the RPRs for syphilis, I have to follow this baby's blood until it was negative, and I said yes, I won't have to treat it because it looked like it was a little bit cumbersome. It's doable, but you know, kind of cumbersome to get it all together. Yeah, as as I say, and the the people that can can effectively and efficiently deal with that cumbersomeness. Are your are your ID folks? So, but <laughs> I um, don't think that the, the lab is going to freak out next month when they see all these testing for Chagas. <laughs> <laughs> that that's okay because I really, you know, I've mentioned this. I would really <laughs> love love to come backwards and find out um, whether the number of tests ordered increases sure. after this talk. Well, I I hope it will. You all have been a really nice audience. Thank you for having me. I have.